we got to have a saddle before we can ride, folks, and we got to have a foundation before we can serve. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the access that you've given us to, and the privilege that you've given us to feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all that which is error, all the foolishness and ignorance, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together verse by verse in the Epistle to the Romans, and we had reached chapter 12. As is characteristic of the Holy Spirit, before you are ever exhorted to serve the Lord, you are expected to have at least some knowledge of the Lord. Doctrine. And in all cases, we see it throughout the doctrinal epistles. There's a solid foundation laid concerning the truth of God's sovereignty, man's total depravity, and the gospel has provided the good news for us through the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's important that we know those things before we can serve. So clearly, the Holy Spirit expects us to understand the truth before we begin to serve, and that's that's really basically true in all cases in the Scriptures. So we've had 11 chapters. Think about this. 11 chapters concerning the doctrine of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 11 chapters of all the tremendous, the abundant blessings that we've been given in Christ all the many great and precious promises and truths whereby whereby we become partakers of the divine nature. And then we come to, to chapter 12, where that our, our walk, our journey really begins in the most absolute sense. It, it began with him being declared to be God by his resurrection from the dead. And that good news concerning Jesus Christ as God culminates in the last verse of the 11th chapter, for from him, by means of him, and toward him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. It is inconceivable to me how many Christians want to live their lives as though they are in control. You have clear pronouncements of Scripture that God is sovereign. God has concluded all in unbelief that He might have mercy upon all. And we've had 11 chapters of the wonders, indescribable wonders of the love and the grace of our God. Man was totally depraved. He can't hear the Word of God. He can't receive the Word of God unless he's one of God's sheep. He can't believe. Man is totally depraved. The modern church has departed entirely from the concept of total depravity, and almost all modern evangelism in modern churches put the onus on the human being. It's up to you. You decide whether you go to heaven or hell. When it's described as a birth new birth, and you didn't decide who your father and mother are, you don't do that in physical life, and yet people by the score conclude that they do it in the spiritual life. You were born by the will of God, not by your will. You were born from above by God, John 1, 13. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. They are not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can they be. And yet in the 8th chapter, 
We're told that whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. And whom he did predestinate, he called. Whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, he glorified. What marvelous truth. God did this, and it's done. And now we begin our journey into the 12th chapter. I implore you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. First of all, the word by is our word dia, by means of the mercies of God. And the word mercies has to almost strike you as, as sort of odd. God is sovereign. He spoke the worlds into existence. He's the sovereign monarch of eternity and of all creation, and he, he has a right to demand of you, but he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that here at all. He, he lays down, the, the law doesn't say, I demand you by means of law. You know, you would think that after the 36th verse of the 11th chapter, the way that the 11th chapter concluded, for from him, by means of him, and to him are all things, you know, that he would say, I demand you, but he doesn't. The word is mercies. Compassion. How wonderful in your life to know that God is working in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure that God knows the way that you take, and when he's tested you, you will come forth as gold. There's no doubt about that. How can Christians have any peace or any rest or any joy outside of the knowledge that it is God who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, that I will uphold you, branded your name on the palms of my hands, bottle your tears and light your candle, and wherever God wants you to be, wherever you are, he works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Those are wonderful things to know. But after the 36th verse, you'd think that he would, he would say, that, or you'd think that we would be called before God based upon his sovereignty, upon his power, upon his majesty, to present our bodies a living sacrifice out of law, the sense of law, or demand, but he does not. He has the right to, to lay claims upon us. He bought us with a price. We belong to him. He can do what he wants with us. Why would we be implored by the mercies of God? Well, there, there are two main words for mercy in the Greek. This is the one that would would more conform with our English word compassion or love. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by means of God's compassion. And folks, I don't I don't know how to put it put it into words. I speak to so many Christians in my correspondence in this ministry, and I can't help but conclude that their image of God is not the God that's revealed in, in the scripture that somehow he's dealing harshly with them and, and that they either they either deserve judgment or they don't. They, they either deserve the trials they're going through or they don't. They don't live very good lives. That's why all this is happening to them. And they, they know that they're sinners and God has every right to make it rough on them. Very seldom do I run into Christians who are rejoicing in the fact that our God is a God of love, the God of comfort. It's God who comforts us in all our tribulation. Folks, God loves you. If, if you were to ask God, and I don't, I don't in any way suggest that you should, why something befalls you that you don't like, the answer has to be because I love you. It isn't because he hates you. It isn't because he's angry with you. It isn't because he's judging you, but because he loves you. 
it may be easy for us to say that's a strange way to show love, you know, but but oh, it's a brilliant way since it's since it's God. I beseech you by the means of the compassion of God, not the power of God, not the judgment of God, not the anger of God, not the justice of God. It's the love of God, the compassion of God. I don't know how many ministers I've talked to who say, you know, I really believe that, but I wouldn't dare preach it to my congregation because all my people would become licentious. They can just go out and do anything they want to do. And I, and I look at them and I say, well, that's what they're doing anyway. Folks, that's what you do. I can't even comprehend it. But if knowing that God Almighty loves you with an everlasting love, that he deals with you in love and in mercy, if that leads you to licentiousness, I guess I don't understand love. If it's law... I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to get around it. You know, there's got to be a loophole, you know, somewhere in that, in that law. But how do you fight love? The reason we are employed by the Holy Spirit to present our bodies a living sacrifice is because of the love and the compassion of God. God is not angry with you. God is not judging you. God has redeemed you. He paid a price that's beyond your imagination. He gave himself in your place. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. By the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ, we were made righteous. Romans 5, 18. These are wonderful truths. Wonderful truths. And sadly, most Christians don't even know that these truths exist. I don't want any of you to go away from this video thinking God is angry with you. Folks, God loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. If you followed us through these chapters in Romans, you've seen that. He loves you with a love that's as far above our comprehension of love as the heavens are above the earth. I implore you by the compassion of the sovereign, majestic God of all eternity that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. The problem is in the word sacrifice. We always come out with a, with a concept of the sacrifice of Christ as a substitutionary sacrifice. I'm amazed at how many Christians don't realize that most of the sacrifices of the Old Testament were non-bloody so this is not a bloody sacrifice, but an act of worship, of service. They were sacrifices of worship. The atonement was a bloody sacrifice performed once a year by the high priest. The Lord Jesus Christ has perfected forever those whom he set apart. I'm astounded at how many Christians think he did a poor job of that. You know, he might, he, well, he might have perfected Paul forever and he might have perfected some minister i know but not me you know no I, i'm the exception no he can't perfect me come on i mean how can we just throw god's word out he has perfected forever those whom he is setting apart because of his sacrifice on the cross you are holy unblameable and unreprovable in his sight most of the christians i talk to you know, it's like, like, well, I'd like to be there someday, Steve. Yeah, that's my hope. Someday I hope to be un, unblameable and unreprovable. And Look, folks, if you're not unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, you don't belong to Christ. If what Christ did is not enough, folks, who in the world's going to do more? It seems so common in my experience, at least as I talk to people. Once you know all that God has done for you, you know, go out and save the lost. You'll notice chapter 12 doesn't start that way. Now that you know all of this doctrine, go out and convert the lost. The first command in the doctrinal portion of the Word of God, bear in mind, I've pointed this out in past videos. 
the doctrinal portion begins with Romans and, and, and Christian doctrine you get from 13 New Testament books. I recognize that the Old Testament scriptures are profitable for doctrine, reproof, uh, for instruction in righteousness. But without the doctrinal epistles in the New Testament, the Old Testament's not very clear. That's why they're profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for instruction in righteousness. You are righteous, folks. So therefore, you need some instruction. The first command, and I've pointed this out in past videos, the very first command in the doctrinal epistles is in the sixth chapter of this book. And I've often, I've often thought when I talk to ministers, it would have seemed to me that the first command ought to be to preach the gospel. It isn't. The first imperative, the first command given to you by the Holy Spirit is reckon yourselves dead to sin. Romans 6, 11. I didn't say it. God did. The word reckon is legitimai. Look at the logic. Look at the facts. Don't look at what your mind says. Don't look at your life. Don't look at your circumstances. Don't look horizontally in this. The spirit of this age is Look at the facts that God has revealed. You're dead to sin. Dead to sin. I can't believe over the years, folks, how many Christians have said to me, well, you know, I tried that, Steve. I really did. You know, I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to reckon myself dead to sin. And the next thing I knew, I was sinning. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That isn't what it said. It didn't say stop sinning. It said reckon yourself dead to sin. Not a one of you out there is going to stop sinning. We are sinners in the flesh. Nothing in the flesh is good. The works of the flesh are clearly enumerated in the Word of God. Don't be one of those thousands of Christians who are spending their lives trying to clean up the old man, trying to make the flesh good, trying to dress up a corpse. It isn't good. It never will be good, and it can't be made good. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, and on and on it goes, and that's what they are. That's what the flesh does. But you are delivered from this body of flesh because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. You're not delivered because of anything you did. God redeemed you. God forgave you. God sanctified you. God made you holy. God made you unblameable. God made you unreprovable. You're not in the equation. That's what God did for you. Now live like what you are. Live as who you are. I implore you, brethren. Brethren, we're in the same family, in the same household, and God has dealt to every man according to his good pleasure, and I don't suppose we ought to spend our lives complaining that he gave somebody else more than he gave me. You are God's child. You are what he, he wants you to be. You're where he wants you to be, and he's working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. So we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. That is, we stand before God recognizing that, that we are new creations in Christ Jesus, and we keep our body in, in su uh, under subjection, as Paul said. We do that out of love, out of love, because we have been made alive in Christ, a living sacrifice, alive from the dead. If you do that, folks, out of fear, you're going to lose. If you do that because, because you think that you're going to be judged harshly by God and you have to do this based on law, then it won't work. Our relationship is a unique relationship. It's, it's a relationship. But if we class it with the other religions of the world, it is absolutely unique because in, in every other case, Every other case, without exception, it's man doing service to whatever the deity is in order to gain favor from the deity. It's very, very seldom do I ever want to repeat what I just said. Run that back and listen to that again. It's true, folks. 
That doesn't carry over. That pagan mentality doesn't carry over into Christianity, yet that's what Christianity has become today. How'd that happen? Christianity is absolutely unique. It, it's not only a relationship, but it's a relationship based on love. Why would I go to the mission field? Because I love him. Why would I preach? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Because I love him. Why would I witness? Because I love him. Why would I study his word? Because I love him. And I am astounded at Christians who apparently don't think that's a strong enough motive or that's a strong enough bond. You know, we got to have some kind of law, Steve, some kind of regulation. You know, I do it because I must. I remember years ago, I was counseling a couple who were engaged to be married, yet they believed it was all about law. You know, whenever we talked about things of the Lord, it was always regulation, law, fear. And I said, I said, boy, you know, that's some husband you have. And she said, yeah, he's absolutely marvelous. And I said, well, I just think it's amazing that a guy that good looking, and he was, you know, would be faithful to you. And, and she said, well, why is that? And I said, well, because I figured that it, he must think that if he isn't, you'd wind up divorcing him. Oh, no, 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 no. She said, he'd, he would never do that because he really loves me. Really? I said, you mean his love for you is a stronger bond than regulation and law and requirement? Why isn't it that way with Christ? Folks, if your service for him based on love is not as strong as based on law, then, then I'm, I'm totally confused. I, I don't understand that. The reason we present our bodies as living sacrifices is because God loves us. And because he loves us, we love him. I don't know how many times Christians have come to me and said, you know, Steve, one of the things God can't do is make you love him. Really? Him loving me is the way that he made me love him. We love him because he first loved us. That sounds a whole lot like he made me do it. We love him because he first loved us. This is not a relationship of law. It is not a relationship of regulation. It's not a, regu uh, a relationship of fear. You know, if I don't do this, I won't get any reward, or, or I may even go to hell, which is the, seems to be the popular theme of m most of modern Christianity. Most of the Christians you know have some kind of, of an ins insidious idea that if they're not careful, they might not wind up in heaven, but in hell. I was absolutely staggered when Billy Graham was on television and, and whoever the announcer was who had no idea of biblical truth, you know, do you think you'll go to heaven? And Billy Graham says, I trust that I've done enough in my life that I go there and I almost fell off my chair. That's absolutely staggering to me. Right here on YouTube, I've been asked to debate atheists and folks I won't do that my Bible says I'm to abstain from arguments of science falsely so-called that includes flat earth and all the rest of that stuff and you know and they speak a language I don't understand I, I speak a language that they don't understand now I know what some of you think about that and I also know that they give courses on apologetics and Bible college but I won't do that because the word tells me not to do that folks this is not a game this is not a relationship that's uh, based on feelings or, or emotions it's it's not a this is not a relationship it's not a worship or a service driven and motivated by what we think is right or what feels right but on what this book says folks that's the bottom line here, never should we ever say, oh, yeah, I know that's what the word says, but 
this is what I'm, you know, I, I, I understand, Steve. I know that that's what that says, but it's the butt that gets us in trouble. It's our butt that gets us in trouble. I may have told you this. I'll tell you again. I was watching one of those debates once where an atheist said in, in that program, the trouble with you Christians is that you won't admit that there might be a slight possibility that you're wrong. And I will. I, I don't believe there's a God. I'm an atheist, but I will admit that there is the tiniest possibility that I might be wrong. And this Christian said, oh, you're wrong. I'm willing to admit that I might be wrong. You've got to be kidding. That's like someone asking me to admit that I'm not married. You know, there isn't the slightest remote possibility that I'm not married. For heaven's sake, so, I mean, gosh, how can I, how can I explain this? On occasion, I've, I've had people want me to counsel them, you know, on marriage. Sometimes I do, but I don't know anything about a marriage. I only have one wife, you know, get Solomon. He had 300. He knows a well more of a lot more about marriage than I do. But I do know that the most problems in marriage are a result of it being governed by law, not grace. Law, not grace. Have any of you folks ever really stopped to think how the, the husband and wife relationship should be or that it's unconditional, It's it, there's a reason for vows, you know, traditional vows till death do us part and, you know, for better or for worse, it's not conditional. It's not, well, I'm going to love you until you mess up, then I'm going to get a divorce. Same with raising our kids, same with our children. How many of you out there would write to me and tell me, yeah, I love my kids, but you know, only up until the point where they mess up and then I, I don't love them anymore. How many of you are going to say that? And yet, Christians are willing to take that over, carry that over into the, the, the spiritual realm of everything, or they're hesitant to carry that same moral human principle over into the spiritual realm where the, the same principle applies even greater. But, but no, what they do is, is they, they think that somehow in the spiritual realm, it's all changed. It's not the same as, as loving unconditionally here with our spouse. It's not the same as loving our children unconditionally here. We, we're going to do that. You know, we're not going to throw our husband or our wife away. We're not going to throw our, our children away, but God's going to throw us away if we mess up. Are you kidding me? And so we wind up talking about that. You know, and sometimes the problems are worked out. Anytime I, I try to counsel others along those lines, there is no way that you could get me to admit that I don't belong to Christ. You couldn't get me to do it. I, I know it's true. I know He loves me. He's not up there picking on me. He's not up there rejoicing over whatever suffering is taking place in my life. He's dealing with me as a loving and a gracious God. And dearly beloved, you stand before him as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. You're only presenting yourself to him as he already sees you, as who you already are. This is the wonderful God that you serve. This is the God who loves you, who loves you so much that he died in your place, and if he died in your place, you cannot die. This is Steve, I love you all, I truly do. Thanks for watching.